Tim, are you the mediator of this thing? I mean, I told him he can jump in and say something if he wants to. I think you sit there and look pretty. <laughs> That's what I used before. What's going on, guys? Dr. Matt here of the Roadie Strength Podcast. Got a really special guest on today, Connor Murphy, recording right out of his apartment down in Boston, Dorchester. So uh, what's going on, Connor? Excited to have you on. I'm much excited to be here. I like how it's like you have to specify. You're like downtown Boston. Well, Dorchester, <laughs> but downtown Boston. <laughs> hey, a, an awesome spot you have here. Ha- uh, thank you for having me in. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I won't get too, too much into some of your background because I know we're going to talk a lot about that during the podcast. Um, right before we start, I want to get into some rapid fire questions. You ready? I'm good. Let's do it. We got best coffee in Boston. American provisions. Nice. I think Tim predicted that one. <laughs> any uh, any special kind you get there? Or? Uh, a lot of times I'll even just buy their beans. Yeah. Because I have a do like a pour over setup over here, so they just usually have really good beans from there. Nice. Outside of that, like every now and again I'll get like a cold brew. Like if I'm buying a coffee at a place, it's always cold brew. Mm, nice, nice. But no cream, no sugar. Or? No, black, no, just black. Nice. Um, and then how about best bar? Best bar. I'm I'm just such a I'm, my fan favorite is Rosa Lyons in okay. Southie. Okay, nice. It's not like a it's not like a big party bar, but yeah, just good people, good guy bar. They they support pretty much everything in the city from school programs to homeless to military veterans to wow. police officers, firefighters, everything. They're just like it's just a good. I always call it the good guy bar. That's pretty cool. Yeah, you, you wouldn't expect that coming from a bar either. Mm-mm. Nice. Uh, favorite sneaker. Um, I have to just, I'm, I have to say the Nano just yeah. because I've I've been around Reebok for so long and I've worked with not just the design team but even the whole production of the shoe and uh, got to see the passion that those people had towards creating the shoe mm. and the dedication that they had towards making it the the best possible training shoe mm. and so like as far as training I just I, I won't train in anything else there's there's running shoes there's other stuff that I'll wear but like for training the Nano for sure yeah totally. I just got my hands on a pair of the um, the X ones, like the grit edition. Mm-hmm. Um, they're super comfy. Actually, when I first tried them on, I'm like, oh, these kind of feel way different than any other Nano I had before. Yeah. But I think like it took a day for them to break in. I'm like, okay, this is my favorite shoe now. It's a nice shoe. Yeah, it's funny because like every variation is is somewhat similar, but yeah. they also kind of like change back and forth. To sure. Focusing on comfort, focusing on durability, focusing on like all sorts of different stuff. Yeah. So if I did, yeah. So it's the nano, and then as far as versatility, just like a an all black Chuck Taylor. Nice to wear out. Nice, cool. Uh, favorite CrossFit lift or movement? Hmm. I like just like a full snatch, like traditional cool. barbell full snatch. Just cool. you know every component of of what you're trying to get better at every. Yeah, you know, modality in training that that you can train with it, whether it's light, whether it's heavy, just the range of motion, the flexibility, the positioning on everything. It's uh, it's it's good to see. It's very pretty when it's done well, mm-hmm. and you can also see how much effort it takes when someone can do it well to get there. Sure. You know, very rarely is someone able to just like have the ability to just pull themselves into that position without a ton of practice. Yeah, totally. I'm the same way. That's my favorite movement. That's actually how I got introduced into CrossFit too. Was uh, I had a friend who was working out of a barbell club, and uh, I just was unable due to shoulder mobility to even get a PVC pipe over my head and do a mm-hmm. squat with it. And it just took me so long to do. I just became obsessed with it, and that's what yeah. just drove me into the sport. <laughs> well, what's what's so funny is is people will look at that and they'll say, well, "I can't do that." Right. So they avoid it at all costs. Right. When the difficulty of the movement exactly describes the need for you to do it right so if you can't get into the bottom of a squat with a pvc pipe it's like as much as that's polarizing Mm. that's also you know like a a definition of what you need to get better at yes the 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 blueprint is there it's like (laughs) oh man this is really really difficult like well you have to work really hard yeah that's why i think it's so cool to where people continue to practice it Mm -hmm. and you you have to practice it Judiciously, right? You mm-hmm. can't expect. Well, that sucked with the PVC pipe. I may as well throw one thirty-five on there and see what happens. Like, <laughs> right. of course, it's a recipe for disaster. But if you can work the different components of, you know, accuracy, agility, flexibility, mm-hmm. everything to get into that position and then do it well, mm-hmm. like that's like the beauty is in the movement. I think that's so unique. Hundred percent. I like that. Uh, you got celebrity crush for the next question. This is sometimes a tough question for people. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to think. I don't I don't follow pop culture that sure. much, but um, I think because I like Ryan Ryan Reynolds so much, yeah. I'd have to say Blake Lively. Cool. All right, that's a good choice. That's a good choice. Or maybe it's Ryan Reynolds. I was gonna. I thought you were gonna say Ryan Reynolds. Yeah. Hey, those are both good choices. <laughs> I'll take it. Um, place most recently traveled. Um, where did I go? Let's see. I was in I was in Washington State in cool. August, but I, I'm pretty sure I've flown. Um, you know, I, I fly back and forth between mm. here and New York a lot. Mm. But as far as like place traveled to, um, I traveled a lot to St. Thomas. Where was it? I had a trip. Oh, Atlantic City. Okay. Yes, cool. was this story was was incredible. One of the people that I work with, um, he was playing a show, DJing down at Atlantic City, and he's like, "Hey, a big group of us are going to go." And I was like, "Great, we'll book it. It'll be like a fun night. We'll go down there. We'll all hang out. Go to a nice dinner." go watch him play and then everyone else because i was like hey let's do it i like booked my ticket right away and then no one else ended up booking their ticket and then so it was just this this <laughs> dj his name's buddy casa so it was just him and i yeah and i was like do you still even want me to go he's like yeah and so <laughs> he like he played another show the night before so we didn't really talk much and i just showed up at the airport i had nice. no i had no bags i had not even like oh he didn't have like a check bag like i didn't have a bag on me yeah, I had my cell phone, my wallet, and I just kind of showed. I was dropped off at the airport, and he looks up. He's like, looks up, and we get to the terminal, and he's like, "I was like, honest, I didn't even think you were gonna be here, so I was gonna turn around and go." <laughs> so I flew to Atlantic City, zero bags. Nice. Uber eats a toothbrush and toothpaste to the hotel room. Outside of that, wore the same outfit, flew back. Cool. How many days were you there? One. Oh, that's yeah. Yeah, it's easy. Just that night. Nice. nice. I think we we landed at noon. Yeah. And had a car service taking us down to Atlantic City from Philly. And then when we finished playing at three in the morning, we had a car service back to the airport. Got in the time machine and I was back in Boston. Yeah, like oh, that was an interesting twenty four hours. Yeah. <laughs> nice. so that was that was the last trip. Yeah. Cool. Um, so kind of a two part question: Do you have anywhere planned to travel, or do you have any place that you really want to go next? Uh, I'm really excited. <laughs> you talk about traveling. Yeah, I'm really excited. This Friday, I go down to um, to Disney in mm-hmm. Orlando to run a marathon with one of the first athletes that I coached at the CrossFit gym we opened in St. Thomas in the Virgin mm-hmm. Islands. So she she's wanted to run a marathon, and her aunt passed away, and so she's going to do it in memory of her. And she asked me when we were recently in St. Thomas if I would run it with her. I was like, of course. Mm-hmm. And so. We signed up for it, so really looking forward to doing that with her nice. and, and, and be there with her for that. And then after that, you know, we'll kind of get into this, but I'm traveling um, on a U.S. bus tour with Dylan Francis, mm. who's going on tour. It's a Dylan Francis and Young Gravy. I don't know anything about Young Gravy, but... The name sounds familiar. Yeah. I know Dylan Francis. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Young Gravy's just another artist. Um, yeah. uh, I think he's more in like the hip-hop realm. Cool. But I don't know. Yeah, again, I don't know a, a ton about him. But sure. it should be really interesting. Yeah, so definitely. That starts. I'll meet up with the tour in Michigan, and then we hit. I mean, it's pretty much five weeks of straight touring. Maybe a couple of off days where there's no shows, but a lot of training, a lot of diet, a lot of nutrition, a lot of stuff that you wouldn't think would be on a U.S. bus tour. It's actually the opposite <laughs> of what you would, of what most people would assume as far as you know, going out, partying, living mm. like a like a, that like crazy life. Where hmm. Dylan is very, very adamant about one getting me on tour and two utilizing me. So where it's like, you know, I'm not going on tour as his friend, although I consider myself his friend. I'm going on tour as a trainer, and not just for him, for anyone else who wants it. That's cool. So work with catering to make sure that the right food options are there. We do timed meals. We go to bed at the same time. We wake up at the same time. We do our training. And it's really cool. We have hmm. a, a production cart. Where they, you know, they they bring LED walls, they have sounds, they have everything that they're bringing in, and so we have a cart that just has, you know, CrossFit equipment on it. So we got Sweet. some stuff sent out from Rogue. So that'll be the first thing I bring out, and then I put it uh, wherever in the music venue they're doing sound checks or setting up the stage, and we just have like a big setup in the middle. Anyone who wants to work out will train. And like pack. members of the staff and stuff too. Yeah, I mean, That's people sweet. we had. Last tour I did, we had the tour manager, photographer, nice. we had merch guy coming in. We had security from the other artist who would come in and say, I'm like, hey, I'm, if I'm here to train, like, no way. that's what I'm here for. Yeah. And then, you know, before the show, pack up the cart, it'd go back on the bus, watch those guys do their <laughs> thing, fill it out with 
thousands and thousands of people that are there to like, you know, drink and party and do yeah. their thing. And it's cool. It's, Sweet. It's, it's unique, but it's really fun. That's awesome. I feel like also, like you said, like on a, on a tour bus situation like that, I feel like even, I mean, I've seen like documentaries and movies how like the band, like they party nonstop for weeks. Yeah. So it's almost like, and, and their health deteriorates. Like you look at people like um, even like uh, like Avicii and stuff like it's it's sad like what can happen so um, it's cool they're taking a very like okay we want to we're worried about our health or not worried we we want to focus on our health mm-hmm. for like these six weeks because like it's important yeah and there's and I know there's a few artists that that do that yeah and I think because of the people who paved the way before them yeah to where you look at you know you watch these documentaries on the like rock bands that would travel yeah, and you yeah. were like how <laughs> yeah. how do you even play a show when Literally. that's what happened before but that was that was the lifestyle yeah but i think people now obviously follow it's you know more of a holistic approach and and healthy approach because they've seen people like Avicii who mm-hmm. what a lot of people didn't know is there were multiple tours that he was on where he was partying and doing his thing where he canceled some yeah. of the last shows yeah and checked himself into rehab so it's not all, you know, it's not all the, the you know, the glam and, and fortune that everyone, like, sees from the outside. It can, it can get into a pretty dark place. Sure. And for as long as I've known Dylan, um, Dylan's dad is also an um, alternative medicines doctor. Oh, cool. So, again, when we talk about, like, holistic approaches to things, like, it's always been, you know, had that kind of focus. Mm-hmm. But when we're on tour, it's like that's the most time that he can focus on it because he's not... You know, in the studio, flying around different places, doing all sorts of different things. Mm. It's like, you know, he's got to be on tour. Yeah. He's got to play the shows at night. So right. having the equipment around and having him focus on that. And we, we did an interview, uh, an article at the end of the first tour I did with him in 2019. And it was like, it's like, it's the best I've ever felt. Like, as opposed wow. to it, like, it being like, you know, you have an entire tour and they're like we all hate each other at the end of this we're all upset it's a winter tour everyone got sick everyone did this to where it was like it kind of like flipped the script focusing on Mm. fitness and um it's just kind of a a cool thing because of the because of the rap that that kind of world gets totally And, and maybe this is just my view of it but when i see like clubs edm music you think drinking drugs sure you know partying to where you know he's now paving the way as far as like hey we can still do this really fun stuff and we can have a focus on this and there's mm-hmm. obviously there, there's there's swing on both sides of it yeah to where he's not saying like hey you have to you know <laughs> zero sugars you're like eating meats and vegetables nuts and seeds some for a little starch and and timed meals and then working out every day and then but there's the other side of the spectrum to where it's like there's none of that mm-hmm. to where it's like there's there's an area to where balance you know, yeah you can you can make it a balance and i think that he's willing to you know promote that do it live the lifestyle and all that i think is is really cool and unique and i think a, a lot more beneficial than just kind of playing to your strengths in the edm world and talk about partying and that stuff to where like he's really uh, really dedicated to that space yeah um one more point i want to make on that too is uh i feel like a lot of artists now and i don't know how true this is but i feel like the way they make money is through touring less so than like through the back in the day they release cds and they get a lot of money on on people buying cds but um from what i've heard what i've seen like artists make a lot of money through doing tours so if they can be feel really healthy and feel really good on their tours and Mm -hmm. do more of them it's like it's just gonna be better for them as a business as a crew like so it's it's good yeah i'm not i don't really know the finances behind it i know obviously when you're you know people are selling tickets for shows and that stuff i know a lot of them make a good amount of money on residencies and like club residencies to where they're getting paid to, mm. you know, come and, you know, essentially like a tour, but more so just one off stuff. I know like the popularity of like going on tour is like really where they're getting more people to listen to their music. That's why sometimes you see an, an eclectic, like a duo of people. Mm. During the first tour I met someone out on was Fall Out Boy and Wiz Khalifa. Oh, yeah. And you're like, well, I guess they kind of dress the same because it's like skinny <laughs> jeans, just like where you're wearing Facts. them is a little bit lower. But uh, <laughs> both unbelievably, mm. incredibly talented performers. Seeing Wiz live was, I was blown away. Mm. So a lot of hip hop doesn't sound exactly He's the different. way you would imagine. Yeah, I mean, if you're in a, a recording studio and you have all that stuff going, it's like that's going to be the pinnacle. That's going to be the best sound you're going to have. Mm. 
But when I saw Wiz was incredible, and obviously Fall Out Boy for generations has always put on one of the best shows. Mm. I mean, really one of the best rock bands of, of our generation. Oh, sure, yeah. And their drummer, Andy Hurley, uh, at the time when I met him, was more so getting into CrossFit. Now he's like an no absolute way. animal, has a full gym oh, at his house in Oregon, fully built out, still trains on the road. It's just a, just a, a beast. That's cool. And in a way that... Uh, it makes sense like so crossfit um and this is kind of like going back to the marathon but it's good because um and this is what i learned actually at the level one staff which mm-hmm. you you were one of my level one instructors so we'll get to that but uh um crossfit is great because um the level of fitness you get it's not you're not a specialist maybe in marathon training you're not a specialist maybe in powerlifting but because of um what kind of fitness you get you can kind of like do a little bit of everything mm-hmm. and in a way it's similar to like um, because of how versatile the movements are, like you can, you can bring it to like yeah, you can do it at a gym, you can do it like on a military base, you can do it on tour, like it, it can, and it's for all types of people too. Yeah. So it's interesting just at the versatility uh, of the sport. Yeah, and that's I mean, we we talk about on the the CrossFit Level One uh, certificate course. You know, there's lectures on what is CrossFit, what mm-hmm. is fitness, and we we start to define these terms. But in the what is CrossFit lecture. And that's the main point to drive home about variance. And it's 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 our main point, but it was also, it used to be kind of the biggest dagger that people would poke to be like, well, if you train everything, mm. you're never going to be very good at one specific thing. And we're like, yeah. <laughs> like, sure. Yes. <laughs> yeah. What's, what's incredible is that, well, define very good at one thing. Mm. <clears throat> Are you going to run, if by training with variance and not, and not you know specialty mm-hmm. will you be able to run a 426 mile for 26.2 miles no, no. not going to happen sorry you're not going to break the world record marathon right it's like if you train with variants are you going to be able to deadlift a thousand pounds it's like well no you're mm-hmm. not going to spend enough time you're not going to beg borrow and steal from every other area to get that much strength yeah. in one thing but what we're seeing now is our incredible feats of strength of speed of flexibility to where when you say, well, you're never going to be very good at something, it's like, well, you may never be the best at something, but who is that guy, Austin Klink, who ran, who back squatted 500 pounds and then ran a sub five minute mile? Yeah. And yeah. you're like, that's the person that I want on my team, whether we are going to war, you know, competing in the CrossFit games, you know, playing in a damn kickball tournament. I don't care whatever <laughs> yeah. it is. It's like, that's the person. And to get there without specialized training, Mm -hmm. this is where people get wrapped around the axle as well. Mm. Is they're like, well, I know a guy who can back squat 600 pounds and run a 445. And you're like, okay, well, what does the training look like? And it's like, well, they train specifically for that. To do those two things. Yeah, and you're like, well, that's not CrossFit. That's not training with variance. We're saying if you are so good at training at variance that... You, you can have these areas that are pretty incredible feats of strength while also being good in other areas. To where, yeah, you could probably train just a heavy back squat and just a mile run and, and be able to beat those, right? That's specialized training. But, mm-hmm. but segmented training yields segmented results, and it always will. The, the blueprint and where you are not training is where there will be no adaptation. To where we can take Austin Klink, who is a CrossFit athlete, who who did the feat of a 500 pound back squat and a sub five minute mile, not by training specifically for it, mm-hmm. but just by being generally physically prepared. We take his ability and capacity mm-hmm. and put it up against, you know, senior specialists who just wanted to do heavy back squat and running. Yeah. It's like, great. He may get beat. Austin may get beat by this guy in the back squat and running, but I could even pair a workout that is the same two things, mm-hmm. but to where this other guy isn't training, to where Austin's going to mop the floor with it. Right. Him. Let's right. make it four rounds, ten back squats, a two twenty-five, and a four hundred meter run. Yeah. And it's and and when you're not training in that specific modality, yes, you are going to fall short every time. Right. Yes, there is some carryover with functional movements and mm-hmm. with adaptive and athletic capacity, but <clears throat> why CrossFit is so incredible in that area is that once you get so good at something, it's like, all right, now work on something you're not as good at. And it just expands that variance bubble to where, you know, you look at someone, obviously we can talk about um, 
the prior fittest man on earth, Matt Frazier. Mm -hmm. And you're like, like, I'm sorry, but you're not going to be mad at anything. And like, there's like specialists that like, unless you're the best in the world, like you're also not going to be mad. (laughs) And let me tell you something, even if you're really fit and you find something that neither of you guys have ever done before, you're not going to beat him in that either. Like, (laughs) like that is how dedicated to variance and, and training, you know, functional movements at high intensity, how potent it is. True. True. And there used to be the argument. It'd be like, oh, there's people who are fitter than the, the fittest on earth. And now people are just kind of like, okay, yeah, you're right. Because <laughs> you look at him and you're like, how, like, how? How does this guy you know, run this fast? How is he still snatching 300 pounds? How is he still doing all this stuff? And right. I mean, it's, it's incredible hard work. And you have to give it to the program that was able to get that capacity. But you can't take it away from the individual that is just simply more driven, a harder worker, and, and better at you know these other things. It even comes down to, you know, your your genetic potential. Right. Like if 100%. you you look at the like the Vitruvian figure as far as like uh, anthropometric measurements, to where there is essentially a perfect body, like an anatomically sound body. What you're starting to see at the top levels of CrossFit are people who are closer to that. You're no longer allowed to not allowed. You you no longer see like the anomalies mm. to where you have like. The Austin Maliolos, who mm-hmm. is a, he's, you know, five, seven, but his wingspan is seven, two to where sure. you're like, it's great for deadlifting really long arms, but because it's not going to be that perfectly sound, but no matter how hard he works, mm-hmm. he's just not going to ever be at that level. And even though he, he competed at the very highest level, right? there's no amount of drive or dedication because of his body measurements that are ever going to but to put them at that. So we are right. really reaching like a, a peak genetic potential yeah. with these different kind of athletes. And I, I digress there, but no, it's just, yeah. just incredible to see like what people are capable of. Um, I'm curious um, to what you think. So I listened to the um, Matt Frazier uh, podcast with Joe Rogan a little while ago, and he talks about, and he, he's released his programming since then. Obviously, a lot of people do it. Um, he says he kind of breaks up his style of programming almost... To, the way I interpreted it was, he's like, oh, I don't do Metcons all day. I kind of break up. I have a strength piece. I have a monostructural piece. And everyone's like, oh, he doesn't do like tradi- traditional CrossFit. And my thoughts were like, isn't that how CrossFit was kind of designed in the beginning anyway? Like kind of breaking up each piece. Like you have a strength piece, you have a monostructural piece, like day by day. Yeah. And this is, again, we. <clears throat> I love that you brought this question up. And hopefully if there are people who follow programming or, or follow CrossFit can, can understand this is from the very beginning, it wasn't one hour a day. However, caveat, most people, most of the time in most circumstances, are going to the gym for one hour a day. That is why a high intensity CrossFit workout is the most beneficial thing for that person to do. Mm. Matt Frazier is not the average person, nor is he Mm. training for one hour a day, nor does he have any other job that he's really doing or at least at the time he was doing, you know, of course, he's also like becoming a chemical engineer, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, he's just better than us. <laughs> but from the beginning, Glassman was like, you know, the founder and, and, and prior CEO of CrossFit. It's like if I had all day for someone, mm-hmm. yeah, we would, we, would, we would vary it up. But we'd have conditioning pieces. We'd have skill work. We'd have gymnastics. We'd have our Metcon. We'd have more strength pieces. We'd, if you were training all day... Yeah, you have to train in the areas to where you have weaknesses. And if you just train high intensity efforts all day, it's like, well, what's going to happen? At some point in time, you're going to need more rest as opposed to grinding yourself down all the way. Well, where can you work neurological components? We talk about the, the 10 general physical skills. Well, there's, there's four that are organic adaptation. That's your strength, flexibility, cardiorespiratory endurance, and stamina. But then we have these neurological skills to where you can train these things via practice without fucking exhausting yourself. Those are the things where you're working with a PVC pipe, putting yourself mm-hmm. in the right position. There are the more, I mean, I mean, there's there's all sorts of different ways that you can mold and move that to where it's not just grinding your dick into the ground for 12 hours a day to then not be able to recover. Mm-hmm. So it is a smarter way of training, but... No one, when, when CrossFit came out, no one was saying, you know, I think it gets mixed up in the level one to where mm. people in a regular CrossFit class are like, oh, we got to strengthen a Metcon every day. Well, one, that's routine. Two, it's just not what people need. Mm. 
99% of the time in a gym, when people tell me, hey, I need to get stronger, I look at their movement positioning and I think you will be more beneficial moving better than getting stronger. Hmm. If you are not failing your front squat because you can't stand the weight up, then yeah, maybe you need to get stronger. But most of the people, why that's happening is because that barbell is just slightly forward of the frontal plane. So now we're starting to get a, a breakdown of midline stabilization where the bar is coming forward and the upper back rounds and then it drops. And like, well, I need to get stronger. It's like, no, you need to move better. Mm. And to why, yes, there's benefits in both and you can obviously train both. But spending time doing squat therapy against a wall will be more beneficial to you than trying to get more organic adaptation of breaking down your muscle fibers, rebuilding them back up to where there's actually a physiological change in your tissue. Mm. It's like, could that be beneficial? Yes. But most people could spend more time moving better. And when there's 19 things in a workout to where you have one hour, the issue is that the coaching piece is just removed from it to where it's like, hey guys, here's all this shit you have to do. Mm. Rather than taking the time of, of moving people through these positions, it's miserable, it's not fun, but you have to find creative ways to do it. But you're going to decrease the risk of injury. You're going to increase people's fitness without any physiological change to their tissue from, from the strength perspective mm. and gaining flexibility, knowing where to put the bar at what point in time, when to pull under. So when people say, Fraser training this way, so this is how I need to, it's like, Hate to break it to you, you're not Frazier. And unless you're one of, of maybe 12 people in this world, yeah, right. you're not anything close to that. And that's not saying not to train for it. Mm. But if you're, comp- if you're dedicated to competing, then that's what you need to do. Outside of that, a 12-minute workout once a day is enough for you. Mm-hmm. And especially if you have a coach that's good enough to be able to help you move better. Right. You don't have to fix everything. You don't just wave your magic wand. Right. And then you who can't get to the bottom of an overhead squat with a PVC pipe just gets fixed. But maybe on that training session, you're able to pull the bar a little bit closer to your frontal plane. Or maybe your knees don't go in quite as much. And it's like if you're just pushing that lever to get better and better every day, that's where it's going to be. Right. But if you have 12 things to worry about in a workout, most of the time, a lot of the technique component, a lot of like the real pieces of the skill get removed. Yeah. It's like, all right, guys, today's workout after your back squats and your 50 GHC sit-ups for time, we have, you know, Amanda, which is, you know, squat snatches and muscle-ups. You can't do a muscle-up, uh, do some ab mat sit-ups. If you can't do a squat snatch, um, you know, grab a baseball bat and swing. And you're just like, there's no, like, <laughs> where's the scaling to where you're going to get people better? You don't have time for that. Yeah. If you only have, you know, 10 minutes allotted for this six-minute workout, you don't have time to get people better. Right. So sorry I went on a rant. No, I like that because like from a physical therapy perspective, I first of all, I love that squat therapy drill. I do that all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's one of the drills we learned from the level one, um, the seminar. Um, and I, the way I think of it too is like, yeah, building strength obviously is super important, but y- you don't want to build on a shaky foundation either. Like you don't want to reinforce a position that's already bad. Like you said, like, oh, maybe you're coming a little forward. If you're just building strength on that, you're still forward. Mm-hmm. You're just not getting better. So I like that a lot. And you see, you, know, you see people that have, or at least you used to. Mm-hmm. You know, you get the people like the Jason Kalipas who were so were light years beyond other people's capacity, even though they weren't moving in the best positions. To where, mm-hmm. if he would have had to take an one, you can talk about even like muscle crowding and, and the ability to even get into positions once you get so strong. Mm. But if he wanted to take a step back to refine his mechanics, which weren't like miserable, sure, but he could put himself in shitty positions and still be an incredible athlete. Mm. Like now you're not seeing it as much because, you know, as we know, straight lines are strong lines. Like moving in an efficient movement pattern is better than having more capacity. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and a good buddy James described it to me like this, and it just made so much sense to where let's talk about two athletes. So let's talk about you and I. And I could have, you know, way more capacity as far as, you know, I can hold 25 calories a minute on a rower and I just have a lot more fitness, but I'm not, I'm moving like dog shit. Mm. I mean, poor mechanical positions, major mechanical errors. Let's say my fitness bank is a million dollars. That's how much fitness I have. Mm -hmm. Let's say you don't have maybe as much capacity, but 
you move a whole lot better mm. to where you only have $250,000 of fitness and I've got a million. It's like you look on the charts and you're like, oh, I'm going to crush this. Right. But now with every movement, you're expending energy. So think now with every movement, you're withdrawing from your account. Mm. If even at the start and as it gets exponentially harder and my form gets worse, it's like right. I'm making major, major withdrawals from my fitness bank account for each movement of a thruster. If my elbows are touching my knees, my, my you know knees are rolled in, my upper back is rounded, that is taking up so much more energy moving mm. in inefficient lines to where you may not have the same capacity, but if you're moving in perfect straight lines, it's like I'm doing withdrawals of $100,000 to where you're, you know, you're making withdrawals of, of 50 to 100. Right. It's like at some point in time, those movements, at, at some point, you are then going to pass me on that level because of your efficiency and movement. Sure. To where now it's like people just want millions and millions in their fitness bank to where if they were just to take a step back and be a little bit more efficient with their movement, that would increase their overall fitness by definition. We talked about your work capacity across broad tone and mobile domains mm. exponentially. Mm -hmm. So there is there is that like how much fitness do I need? How well do I need to move? It's like if you can build it on a solid foundation like you were talking about. Yeah. It's only going to like that that low trajectory to a distant horizon. It's only going to be a, a more efficient path. Right. Rather than, right. you know, there's athletes even that I still see. I'll go back yeah. into a gym and they were like the fittest in the gym at the time. And then now they're still kind of there. And now later on, they're going to be like middle of the pack. And they just go hard. Yeah. And they have that. And they look jacked. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, like this is the person. <laughs> but like, but at some point, they're hitting a wall to where you're either going to slow your adaptation of the actual program or your risk for injury. Sure. You know, sure. As, as someone in the medical professional field, like you put yourself in poor positions long enough. One, functional mm -hmm. movements are, they're inherently safe. Sure. Unfortunately, you know, here's a key example. I've never once walked into a gym ever of any caliber and said every movement in here is perfectly sound. Yeah. No. There are people who probably haven't maintained all five points performance of the air squat f once on any squat. Mm -hmm. Knees roll in a little bit, back rounds a little bit. And guess what? They didn't spontaneously combust. <laughs> like they are inherently safe. And it is safer to do them poorly than mm -hmm. to not do them at all. Yeah. To have zero capacity. But there's the people who don't get that like, hey, maybe take off the gas pedal a little bit mm -hmm. move a little bit better because it's a it's a you have a greater chance of being fitter down the road and right. also decreases the risk longevity of injury. Yeah. yeah cool i like that a lot um let's uh let's uh switch topics a little bit we're actually we're technically still in the rapid fire <laughs> so uh which is fine that happens a lot but uh um let's go one book uh that impacted your life I've talked about this before, and if I have to say one book, the book is called A Message to Garcia. Okay. Uh, I recommend anyone to borrow it from a friend, purchase it, go to the public library. It'll take you about 10 to 15 minutes to read. Really? It is very simple, but incredibly profound. Um, it, as far as impact on it, like, you know, I could always recommend a book that's two, 300 pages and sure. so be like, oh, cool, I know. Or read the spark notes version like this is one to where you can grab it pick it up read it and it could change your life it's a 10 to 15 minute book awesome it's incredible i like that i'll definitely look into it yeah uh favorite podcast you know people always say this when you're on a podcast and you're like <laughs> oh the podcast i'm currently on yeah but um but, and i've always said this brian Chantosh has a has a podcast called um tosh crooked butterfly and kind of similar to this, he just gets on the mic and just just speaks his mind. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times he has some like really, really good points to drive home, but he also doesn't speak in absolutes. Sure. To where there's times where he, he drives home a good point and then he's like, fuck, I don't know, like maybe. Like, <laughs> you know, this is, these are just my thoughts and my opinions. Sure. And then there's also some times to where he like, you can tell his mind is just, it's, it's, it's trying to focus on one thing, but there's so much stuff going on, mm -hmm. but he won't like edit it or go back or yeah. talk about this. He's just like, here are my thoughts. And it allows it to be okay. Even when I'm trying to public speak or even when I'm just thinking to, I'm like, fuck, I'm all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it I gives always, you permission to yeah, do that. Yeah. Yeah. I always sing this guy's praises and, cool. um, I like, I like what he does a lot with, with some of his programs. So check him out. It's, uh, on Instagram. He's like Tosh crooked butterfly. 
but Brian Chantosh. One time I actually said his name was J- Daniel Chantosh because I was thinking about Tosh.0. <laughs> That's I what fucked, I was thinking about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. Shit, All right, let's check that out. Um, Two very different people. <laughs> um, this is an interesting one. Um, favorite Instagram accounts. And the way I picture it is like the people I look up to of like and either get inspiration from or like learn a lot from. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, this is something that I stole again from Brian is I was especially during the election like doesn't matter what what side you're on sure sure pandemic doesn't matter what what, how, what you believe in or what you think is right mm-hmm. um, you know with when the protests were happening on and were, were happening and there was like this there's so many areas that wanted to create divide and and for me I always found myself kind of leaning in one way or another and when I followed these accounts, like it was just so negative towards the other side that to where yeah. it's like polarizing to where some people think, well, if I believe this, then my alignments are on this side. Mm-hmm. It's like no one's like, well, I believe this, but I'm also here on this sure. issue. So I ended up unfollowing a lot of like the major accounts that that kind of pushed that stuff through and yeah. started following more accounts like, um, like the Good News Movement cool. to where there's no real politics involved it's just like yeah. good shit happening like, i like that like this this person you know sacrifice this for this person to save their life and you're like man that's incredible it's uplifting or, yeah a lot of those things and then on the other side of it well not the other side but uh nature is metal <laughs> nice i like it that remind, it reminds you that like hey like we're animals yeah yeah and and nature doesn't feel sorry for itself mm so when you know when you see like this, it's like you know a, a like a newborn like deer yeah getting like eaten, and it's like that's food for this that's yeah. that's feeding this family and it's like you want to like feel sad about that but it also puts you back into perspective as far as like yeah hey we're all animals here yes and especially like with nature it's like nature doesn't give a shit about your feelings yeah what you did today what you did yesterday like it will it'll always be there so kind of like two different sides of things but just to where just to where it's um you know it's 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 kind of it's more objective yeah it's like yeah this is what it is there's nothing more to it yeah this is what it is there's nothing more to it to where now like i hear information on the news i'm like what are they really trying to say (laughs) right like if they say one thing it doesn't matter what side it on if it's on cnn if it's on fox if it's on any of this like if i hear something i'm like i believe the opposite and it's like like automatic you want to put that in there sure because you're wondering what direction they're pushing you down exactly yeah nature is metal and then good news movement those are cool i like that when you follow them back to back you're going to be like okay this guy's a sociopath (laughs) you get a little bit of both sides i like that um, and this is, I just added this in just based on what we were saying prior, but um, favorite programs um, that you, that maybe programs that, as far as like CrossFit or workout programs that you've yeah. done in the past or that you like now that you think are really sound, really good? Yeah, so <clears throat> the, the CAP, the CrossFit Affiliate Programming, mm. I just know how much goes into that. Sure. And I also know that it matters less what you do for training and more how you do it and who you do it with. Gotcha. So there's a thousand programs. I mean, anyone can write very, very good workouts and people have been doing it so long. Yeah. But why I like that is from a coaching side is there'll be a full template on general warm-up ideas, mm-hmm. specific warm-up ideas, general workout time, like full timelines to help coaches teach and produce a better product and a better class. Mm. Um, one of the first things that came up, and this probably isn't the answer to your question though, but we talk about programs, mm-hmm. is the Phoenix Multisport, which is here in Boston, and then I believe they have another one in either Colorado or uh, Arizona. But the Phoenix Multisport is a um, is a nonprofit program for recovering addicts, mm-hmm. and so I, I believe like the like the rules are it's a, like 24, 48 hours sober you can train there, and I think it just takes. Because as you know, like as of like the CrossFit crazies, like you gotta have a little, you, know, you gotta have a little something going on to like really go full in and dedicate True. to the program. <clears throat> and I've just seen them give back to the members, to all sorts of you know different people, and, and allowing people to to sink their teeth into something that is addictive, but like unbelievably positive for them. Yeah. So the Phoenix Multisport program is uh, is really cool, really unique. I got a chance to 
to uh, to hang out with one of their uh, one of their head I want to say head coaches the directors mm. uh, this last weekend at the wedding and she just does incredible work it's it's really cool sweet this is a I th- I think I'm seeing like an overall theme um, for a lot of things you've been in we haven't mentioned some of them but uh, as far as like water on the waves um, big night live which I definitely want to touch on both of those yeah. a little bit. Um, one is like obviously cruise ships aren't no, aren't known for being super healthy in general. Um, club scene isn't known for being super healthy and like going on tour like, but you're almost like plugging fitness and like health into like each one of these things, which is really cool. Something I just kind of like put together, even with like obviously the Phoenix multisport, just like your idea of like what's good programming. Oh, these people almost like they're not used to that and they almost need it. Like plugging mm-hmm. like health and fitness into that. That's a cool connection I just made. Honestly, I didn't. I never really thought of it. You know, if, if anyone who knows me on a personal level, it's mm-hmm. like, I like to enjoy my fitness as much as I like <laughs> to, like, like get capacity in it. <clears throat> and so being able to bring fitness into those worlds, I think, is, mm. is unique because it's necessary. And they need it. <clears throat> yeah. And so I'll, I'll try to, like, elevator pitch all of these sure. things. Yeah, definitely. Um, 2019 was our inaugural, inaugural year <laughs> of Watt on the Waves which where we chartered an entire cruise ship. We kept all the fun things that we liked about it and mm-hmm. removed all the things we didn't think were as fun and, and put fitness involved in it. We're talking tens of thousands of pounds of dumbbells and kettlebells on the basketball court, sandbags on the helicopter pad, every concept to device you could ever think of on the pool deck, pull-up rigs we had. I mean, everything on there to where it was just a giant fitness ship. But... <clears throat> not fully dedicated to this is just fitness Mm. to more of a celebration of fitness because you do have those two worlds you have like the the party world and you have the fit world and a lot of times why there's not transfer over is because they think it has to be like 100 percent one way right we'll talk about that in a little bit about how some people need that 100 percent. but Mm. a lot of people who are fit want to be around like-minded people they want to work out in the morning but they also want to celebrate their fitness and go to the beach and have a couple drinks and dance and do their thing where some people just try to make it be in the fitness world. And then in the in the party world, people are like, oh, they just want to like continue to do this, where it's like, well, they want to enjoy this, but you know, being healthier is a lot easier way to enjoy that <laughs> than without it. So we ran a cruise. Unfortunately, COVID's shut down our our second cruise, but um, you know, people were people love the ideas. If you I think the Instagram is still up there, you can kind of check out everything that we did there. Um you know, but changed the that was the big piece of it for us to sell the company because there were cruise ships companies that were desperate for the demographic we had. Eighty percent of the people that came on our cruise had never been on a cruise before. Twenty percent had. Sixty percent female. Forty percent male. You know, people were raving about losing weight on there. We had completely flipped rather than you know it's like however many thousands and thousands of pounds of of flour that go that are involved in the pastas and the pancakes and that like <laughs> we had to change up the whole menu to where it was a lot more like protein based with more like fitness you know inspired people so it was it was very unique and was able to touch a demographic that isn't typically in cruising with my company now it's called big night fitness it partners with big night entertainment group <clears throat> which owns a few different venues around the boston area actually there's 18 uh, nightlife and, and dinner venues and we just kind of utilized our four club areas and as of right now we are running uh, in-person classes more like events highlighting different instructors around the area mm. so whether that's cycle whether that's yoga whether it's any kind of hit class whether it's you know doing a sound bath it's like anything that people want to for like the health wellness and mindfulness we're able to highlight and utilize these unbelievable venues to push people towards the instructors and to be able to highlight them as fitness professionals. It's been very unique. We have mm. a few different ways we're going down to um, to expand what is Big Night Fitness to kind of put it on a global scale of, of working through like an on-demand platform, continuing to highlight the instructors in the Boston area as well as a lot of the talent that we train, whether it's professional athletes, you know, UFC fighters, musicians, EDM DJs, any of that. To where you know it's we can highlight the fitness aspect in it, and now we have the background to be like, hey, they they understand both sides of these worlds. Mm. Because there's some people who are straight fitness professionals, yeah. To where what they say kind of falls upon deaf ears sure. when they're referencing to that. So they're like, what is you know what does this person know? Right. And that's you know like a, a quick thing about touring. What I learned very quickly is 
if the, the most effective I can be as a trainer is to do the exact same thing I'm asking my artist to do. Mm. So if like, for instance, Dylan and I, you know, I meet up with them on tour, let's say night one, he has a show. Well, I don't, I don't need to be at the show. You know, obviously sometimes I'll, you know, kind of double is just, you know, making sure he's taken care of. It's like, like quasi security. Sure. So when he gets off the stage, I'll like, you know, walk him and we'll run over to the bus together. But <clears throat> if I'm like, oh, it's 9 PM and he's, he's on from midnight to one and I go to bed early and then he comes in, I wake up at seven and I you know, make coffees and like, you know, Dylan time to train. It's, you know, He'll that, like, would, that I was would, up all night. That would give him <laughs> yeah. the excuse. Not to say that Dylan's ever done this, but with a lot of sure. artists, that would give them the excuse to sure. say, well, I'm going to sleep later because I had this. To whereas if I'm there with him at the show, we go and we, you know, you know, sleep in our, in the, on the tour bus, you know, we have our, our racks together and I'm up a little bit earlier and I make sure everything is set and I'm training at the same time and I'm eating the same thing and I'm following the time diet and I'm doing everything that I'm telling them to. It just kind of like unconsciously gives them permission to say, hey, this is okay. Yeah. To where, do I have to eat and do the same thing as the artist? No, I don't have to. There's We could talk about where I am as an athlete and where they are to where there's something different. But if it makes me more effective as a trainer, mm. is that the best thing for me to do? And I think in some circumstances, yes. And it also speaks to them to where they're like, hey, this person's dedicated on this as well. This is what they're doing. This is what they look like. This is what I want to look like. It makes it easier. It just yeah. it just leaves, you know, you know, the conversations where I'm like, well, I can actually eat this stuff because I went harder in this workout. Sure. To where it's like, man, if I do that for five weeks and I become a better trainer, <clears throat> I'm not there. I'm not there to, to be a, a professional worker outer. Yeah. I'm there to be the most effective trainer I can be. Right. So right. for for those people who have private clients. A lot of times going down that avenue with them, regardless of what you're trying to get them to do, mm. can be the most impactful and most effective uh, for them. Just, And I want to talk about that a little more too, about like, because you have a lot of higher end clients, like what, what motivates them versus maybe just a reg, <clears throat> quote unquote regular average client mm. at the gym. And um, also exactly to what you were saying, like you're running that marathon this weekend because, it, because it's going to help your client basically. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. Well, she was, I mean, now she's like a, like a best friend. Yeah. But you know, when we were in St. Thomas together, she was like, I want to do it, but I don't like, I'm would, like, worried to do it alone. And I was like, yeah, of course, of course <laughs> I'll do that. And then because of that, it's like, now we have the commitment to each other right. that we're both going to do it. And I mean, she's the type of person who would have like figured it out regardless. She's an animal. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, so you know, a lot of times with client, and, and it depends too. And, and this is kind of a rant that I've been wanting to go on. Sure. Um, and in the CrossFit world, it's not foreign for people to come in and say, "I'm I'm willing to make the change. Mm. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. I'm so sick of X Y Z. Mm. I'm sick of having my blood pressure at stroke levels. Mm. I'm sick of having my body fat, you know, above thirty percent. I'm sick of being morbidly obese. I'm sick of the the medications I have to take. I'm sick of having hypertension or you know pre diabetes and, and and glucose intolerance and, and all of these different things. To where some people are ready to make the change, and not to say that this is unique to the CrossFit world or to like traditional training or to bodybuilding or to hit or to whatever people are doing, but I think so many people are afraid of confrontation and they're afraid of hard conversations that they're not ready to give that person the commitment. Hmm. And I think too often people are celebrating minuscule accomplishments mm -hmm. um, like they are, um, you know, prolific. Like sure. it's it, to where, hey, you followed your diet for a week, you know, now you get to eat this dessert or snack. It's like, no, oh, man, fuck that. <laughs> no, you can't. If your goal is to lose 100 pounds, you know when you get to eat that snack? When you lose 100 pounds. Mm. And I've seen it before. I've worked with people who have lost over a hundred pounds because they come in and they're like, I I don't want to I don't want to orphan my kids. Sure. And for some people, like it's that serious. Yeah. For some people, it's like, I don't want like you could take a wrong step off of a off of a curb mm -hmm. and and have and be needed of a serious surgery because of how much extra body weight you have on you mm -hmm. and the lack of coordination to do this type of stuff. It's like you need to be training and you don't need to go you know, two days a week here and then, and then you're doing this, but you can earn your Coca-Cola or you can do this stuff. It's like, no, some people need that hard switch. Yeah. Yeah. And some trainers say, 
you're going to die or you're going to be sick the rest of your life unless you make a change. Yeah. Unless you make serious lifestyle changes and we're not going to reward you until we get to that point. And then when you get to that point, then you can celebrate fitness if you want to. But for some people, it's like they, they live this lifestyle and like, well, I don't want to like sacrifice this much. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, well, it's going to be the end of you. Sure. And I had, I had a conversation the other day that, you know, I've been, I, I work with these, uh, these two girls who do incredible work. And it's funny that I'm talking about this now. Uh, their podcast is called Eat the Damn Cake mm-hmm. to where it's, it's more against like shaming people for, you know, Eat celebrating cake. fitness yeah. rather than it being like, it's okay for everyone. Yeah. Right. You know, but, but on the, on the podcast, it's, uh, you know, we'd like kind of discussed back and forth and, and like, that's, that's a way to go down an avenue that I think is very, very effective. Sure. Sure. But I want to make sure that it's, it's not removed from the table, this option of being all in yeah, or the option of quitting cold Turkey. Yeah. You know, right. For most people that I know that have successfully quit anything, they, they quit. It mm. wasn't the nicotine patches. It wasn't all this like slow things. It was, this is affecting my life and I want to make a change. Yep. And that's all it, that's all it takes. Yeah. You know, people want to talk about willpower and mentality. It's like, no, it's simple. Yeah. If you want to do it more than whatever this product has influence on you, then you'll do it. Mm-hmm. If you don't want to, then you can find other ways and go down that. But if something is impacting your life negatively and you're like, that's it, I'm done. Yeah. I don't want to do this anymore. It's just m- willing to make that commitment and going down there. But what I was saying with the, on the podcast is, you know, we were talking about, you know, like on like Christmas, like, you know, like you're eating an, an unhealthy meal or doing that and not being shamed for it. And I sent a message to two people in St. Thomas because I was looking to get an Airbnb for some friends. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> two people. Neither of them responded right away. One of them <clears throat> was like, oh, did you hear what has happened to my husband? Mm. What happened? Oh, he had a stroke. Mm-hmm. It's like, not the healthiest guy in the world. Beauties, I love this couple. Sure. And you're like, well, fuck. Like, at what point in time do you start to prioritize this now? Or do you need that scare? And sometimes those scares are, are the end of, of, end of a human life. Yeah. To where it's like, at what point in time are you going to be willing to make that change? Like, do you want to live your lifestyle for the next year? Or do you want to make some changes and then and be able to change, you know, who you are right now for who you truly want to be? Mm-hmm. The other person was sick and was in a coma in the hospital. It's like there, there's unhealthy lifestyles. So I was like, fuck, am I doing a disservice as a trainer to not to not look up someone, have that hard conversation, hard conversation mm-hmm. to say, if you don't do this, you're going to either die yeah. or you're going to live an absolutely miserable lifestyle. Because you think this is where you want to be, like you have to look at the bigger picture, yeah. and they're hard conversations. Right. And in order to get someone to do that, it takes a lot of dedication as a trainer. It takes you to be all in. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I think that people are afraid of that. Mm-hmm. And that's, I'm not saying that that is the only way to have it happen. Yeah. But it sure as shit is an option that I think people can't take off the table. Like you've always got to have that in your back pocket to be like, we can change your life entirely. And we've seen it happen. Yeah. Every gym has seen it happen. Mm-hmm. You know, there's <clears throat> one thing I really love that Glassman said is there are more gyms that have had a client lose a hundred pounds than there have been to send an individual to the CrossFit games. Like, right. <clears throat> yeah. That's what it's about. Yeah. hundred percent. And you don't accidentally lose a hundred pounds. <laughs> never. You have to, it's it, never happened. <laughs> it's like, I'm sick of being like this. And sometimes all it takes is, is there's someone looking at their child or all it takes is, is is you have to rock back and forth three times to get off your couch. And it's like, I don't want to do this. Mm. And then you have that click switch. And as a trainer, you need to be ready to receive that. Yes. You need to be ready to be like, okay, I have this plan for you. Here's exactly what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. I'm going to message you every morning at this. We're going to wake up. You're going to do this training session at 6 a.m. every day. Yeah. You sleeping in a tent is a thing of the past. You are never going to do that again. Mm-hmm. Now we're waking up early. Now we're doing this. And they start to see these results. And guess what comes along with that? healthy relationships, you know, mm. better lifestyles, not, not feeling as shitty, not feeling as groggy when you're not eating all of these like inflammation foods. And when you're, when you're going down the right path, like I've yet to be like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to eat clean and I'm not going to drink for two months. Not once after those two months, I've been like, man, I really wish I was eating shitty and drinking a bunch of, <laughs> I feel you know, I feel great. Yeah. And we know it's there. It's just, it's, it's difficult. 
So that was my rant. Yeah, that. I like I like that a lot. Um, going off of that too, um, I think a big part for what I've seen. Obviously, it's, today is January third, so a lot of New Year's resolutions coming up. Um, I saw your video recently on that where you talked about it, and um, there was someone else who posted about it. Um, this um, he's more in the bodybuilding world. Uh, this guy Jeff Nippard. He's a he's a big guy. Um, I don't know if you heard of him before, but he had something similar to say, basically to what you said. It was like um, New Year's resolutions are great. It's an opportunity for people to change, I and mean, people bash on them all the time, but mm. don't listen to that. And basically, he's like, if you have a New Year's resolution, think really, really hard about why you're doing it. Because when th- stuff gets hard, you have to always like kind of like think back to that. So I just wanted to know kind of like what your thoughts were on that, and also just like, is as far as like finding your why, do you see that to be a big thing, especially with like, yeah, we talk about the average um, CrossFitters, but also like the higher end clients too. Mm. Yeah, it's. It's harder for the higher end. <clears throat> I talk about higher end just strictly as financially. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I don't think of them as any better. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, right, right. Even in the slightest bit. <laughs> but yeah, like the New Year's resolution, like it gives people an opportunity to, to find something. And oftentimes, do people fall off quickly? Yeah, like that's just kind of a part of it. But my whole thing about that rant was like, well, as opposed to adding to it, as opposed to adding to that percentage of people who fall off, why don't you make the change to like help one more person stay on and and be involved? Mm. And then people kind of came through and they were like, what is the, you know, it's not the New Year's resolutioners, it's that the gyms and the gyms get overcrowded and all this stuff. And it's like, well, you don't own the gym. (laughs) And if everyone, if, if here's your gym model, if here's your business model of they want as many people to sign up as possible and as little people to come, well then right. maybe the gym model's fucked up. Right. And maybe what we need to do is have 100% of the people who are signed up for Planet Fitness show up on one day and watch that gym <laughs> fall flat on its face. Implode. Yeah. <clears throat> Seriously. So, and, you know, and, it, and if that's what, if you are so absolutely dedicated to your program, then, then you'll figure out another way. Mm-hmm. But I was more so just like, you know, as opposed to someone, you know, I think about someone coming in the gym and and I've never realized it because I've never been in that position. Mm-hmm. I've never been obese. I've never been overweight. I've never not been able to walk into a place to be like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be capable of doing this stuff. And at some point in time, I get out of my comfort zone and, and try to do things like that, but never from a physical aspect. So I don't know if you're 100 pounds overweight, what that feels like going into a gym. And I know that you're probably on a very fragile or thin line to where, yeah, you, you're dedicated to what you want to do. You want to make these changes. But there are things that are just going to make you not feel like you don't belong mm. to where if you get on a treadmill and you're walking and someone's just standing behind you to be like, you, and it's like, oh, this, this is not for me. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, imagine just that one small little impact. And that's what I find at the CrossFit level one certificate course to where there could be just one moment to where it could change someone's life to where if you're this, you know, super, you know, incredibly fit or whatever you want to call it to go up to someone and and chat with them mm-hmm. or be like, Hey, like, let's, you know, are you comfortable doing what you're doing here? Like, I just know the treadmill. It's like, well, let's come in. We'll, we'll do some weight stuff tomorrow. And even those small interactions could be something that helps change someone's life forever. Yeah. Or yes, they are dedicated and that, and that needs to happen. You need to want, there's like so many just cheesy quotes about this. Like you have to want, you know, you have to want more your permanent changes than what you want right now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's like, you'll always, you'll always be where you've always been if you always do what you've always done. Mm. And there, there does need to be that, that need or necessity for change. But I think sometimes people don't know how. Mm -hmm. And when you don't know how, and even though you're really motivated, you can get derailed by lack of motivation or, or someone just saying the smallest thing. And, you know, and it's, it's more so just like reach out, like don't be like the the fitter you are or the more knowledgeable you are in that discipline mm-hmm. should be the more dedicated you are to helping someone else out. Yeah, yeah. Because you are looked at as as a god on some regards to where people would you know kill to look like you. They just they don't know how. Right. And if you can help like bring them the motivation and understanding on how to get them there, I think that's a whole lot more important than you know. You you have an access to the dumbbells you want to shrug at seven p.m. at Planet Fitness like yeah it's a lot more powerful mm-hmm. like you're already at this area still get your workout and obviously still do your thing but don't be pretentious towards those people who are trying to make those changes because they need it 
more than you know more than I do. <clears throat> Not right. to say I don't need it. <clears throat> Sorry, <laughs> but on the you know on the fitness wellness sickness continuum and CrossFit, it's like if you have all your biomarkers towards sick, that's not good. Yeah, you know, there's a thousand different scenarios where someone who has all their markers towards fit or switch the other way around mm. Mm. to where you know your your resting heart rate is you know, 45 beats per minute, your blood pressure is you know 110 over 60, or you know everything any any marker you can have there <clears throat> fitness markers you can deadlift three times your body weight you can snatch two times your weight. like like you're going to be all right in in a lot of different scenarios but when someone is towards sick when they do stuff that's even out of their own control when they get in a car accident or when they slip mm. and fall on ice or when they have like you know some of these things when they get covid mm. when they do any of this stuff it's like they don't have that far to go before things get really, really bad. Sure. So when someone's like, well, yeah, it's just as important for everyone. It's like, yeah, but if I, if I had any of those things happen to me or, you know, general me, general you, mm -hmm. and you have all your markers towards fit, you're not going to, you're not going to fall down that far. Right. And we've seen it. Yeah. And I'm not here to talk about, to discuss what the, the variants of COVID or any of that mm -hmm. stuff. But what we know is that the healthier you are, the, the more of a shield or the more of a of a buffer you have before getting very, very sick. Yeah. <clears throat> so if that's the case, let's get people's markers moving in the right direction. And I wasn't sure if I was going to bring this up or not, but um, I, for me personally, looking into water on the waves, I think a lot of the cruise lines could learn a lot from that, just literally based on what you said, as far as like the, um, <clears throat> the healthy to sick continuum. If you can have a cruise line that really prioritizes health and fitness, like, I mean, if you think about, like you said before, a lot of people that go on those lines are not towards a healthy continuum. They're more towards the sick side. So, um, yeah, I think that's I think that's huge. In St. Thomas, this is not a nice thing to say. I didn't make mm. it up, but um, should we work with a lot of like cruise ships and cruise ship passengers? Yeah, there's a saying where they're like, people who go on cruise ships are newlywed, overfed, or almost dead. Yeah, <laughs> and you know when people are like, oh, I gained 12 pounds on this cruise, it's like that's kind of the typical thought process and so that's going to be the more target demographic to where people are like i just want to sit eat and drink and not worry about anything <laughs> to where it's like maybe you can turn the dial there but why i yeah. think it was <clears throat> why i think it was important for them to see us do it is mm. because we had that demographic yeah to where we were able to speak to these people to say hey these cruises are actually really fun yeah but i would never go on a cruise if it wasn't for the the, the fitness aspect of it sure or i'd be that one person when there's 3,500 people on a ship, I'd be that one person in the gym sitting there on like the water rower doing burpees <laughs> over and people being like, what's wrong with that Why guy? Why is he working out on vacation? Like, a lot is wrong with that <laughs> a guy. A lot. Actually. Yeah. Nice. Um, <clears throat> let's, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, I just want to talk about kind of like what you're doing now as far as your current training um, um, and also like what you're doing for nutrition, what you're doing for recovery, maybe supplements, stuff like that. Yeah, sure. Uh, this has been the least I've been focused on training. Mm. You know, I'd, I'd always would tell people, I'm like, there's no excuse to, to miss a workout. Like, you can always train. And, like, I've worked inside the walls of a gym for the past decade. So <laughs> now that I don't anymore, I'm like, fuck, man, you really, like, some days it's a little bit harder to get there. Sure. But <clears throat> I've got a group of friends, and we kind of just pass workouts back and forth. Mm. I still work one day a week at Reebok. So cool. I try to hop in there to do, um, you know, just whatever the class workout is. I don't need anything special. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll target workouts to specific body parts that I want to look better. Yeah. AKA sure. bench press and GHD sit ups. Let's for a lot go. Of, a couple of days before <laughs> vacation, you know? Yeah. More so kind of do the, the fun stuff. But mm -hmm. um, also, I, I train at South Boston Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Mm -hmm. And they have kind of a whole CrossFit setup there. Mm. So a lot of times I'll do a class and then finish off with some, some different movements. But really, it's whatever I can get it in. We have a gym at the Big Night Entertainment Group headquarters. Mm -hmm. That's just a typical gym. They've got dumbbells up to 50, so cool. a lot of dumbbell squats, dumbbell thrusters, stuff like that. That's really miserable. Yeah. And um, and yeah, just training in any realm. Also, because I am in charge of many different disciplines of fitness and who's going to be teaching classes, yep. um, I find it very important for me to be able to speak to those programs. Mm -hmm. So I'll hop into you know, any one of our instructors' class, whether it's a you know a hip hop dance class or a hit cardio mm -hmm. or a spin class or any of that. You'll find me going out to people's classes before we even bring them into Big Night. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
you know, not that I know so much about fitness where I'm like, oh, this is a phenomenal yoga class. But right. there's intangible stuff that uh, totally. you work in the industry and work with enough coaches to where you're like, yeah, that's that's someone that we're going to want. One is always attendance. Mm-hmm. If you're the best coach in the world and you've been teaching somewhere for years, you're probably going to have pretty good attendance in there. Yeah. Because it's hard to fake, you know, being a good trainer. for. There's only so long you can be a dirtbag to where people just aren't going to show up. Right. Also, it's the care component. Mm-hmm. I care less about what you know and more about how much you care about your people. Totally. Because that's what's going to bring people back. Mm-hmm. We always have this discussion to where you can be the most knowledgeable trainer in the world, but if your delivery is dog shit, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, and then I know people who are the most bubbly personality, and not that they they think they know everything in the world. They're like, I'm not that advanced as a trainer, but this is what I know, and I'm going to be really good at that. Mm-hmm. It's like those are the people that not just everyone else wants to be around, but those are people I want to be around. <laughs> Someone who's willing to learn, who's humble enough, but also it's just like a good time. Yeah. We talk about the aspect of what gets people coming back. It's obviously effective training, but more so too, it's like feeling good. Mm. You could be a boring trainer, have the best workout in the world, and then as as people leave your class, they were like, eh, I wasn't that motivated. Right. But you could go in there and just sit there and, you know, have fun, laugh, smiling, and then as you leave the gym, it's like those, like people are going to go back to that class. Right, right. So been <clears throat> dabbling in, in making sure I'm getting in every different area of fitness and actually really looking forward to going on this tour mm. because that allows me more dedicated time to obviously, one, teaching as opposed to just managing fitness, which is what I'm doing at Big Night Fitness, right. but also my own training and the availability mm. with, with different foods. Um, you know, I found myself, it's effective. I just do intermittent fasting. Mm-hmm. Just because of the simplicity of it, sure. Um, going that long, you know, without without any kind of caloric intake, there's benefits to that. Just like the overall, too. Like the main thing is, you know, if you intermittent fast for one day, it's like, well, great. But what does that do in the long run? If you eat yeah. five thousand calories on Sunday and you know yeah. Saturday and Sunday, yeah. Like in the grand scheme of things, like you're going to look at like the cal- the caloric deficit that may not be there. Right. So just to like manage that. Um, so I have, I have a meal plan, uh, Nutri Meals, mm-hmm. that just simplifies it because I'm going, I'm, I'm all around the city almost yeah. every day. And that just makes it easy to where it's like, they're never frozen. I pop it in. It's like meat and a vegetable. Oh, that's and then cool. I'll, I'll, I'll add some other stuff in there. Nice. Um, <clears throat> supplements. Really, the only thing I'm ever consistently taking is creatine. Mm-hmm. I just started mm-hmm. this. There's a company. I have no affiliation with them at all. It's called Beyond Raw. Mm-hmm. And um, I find it to be effective. I also find it to be the most disgusting creatine I've ever, <laughs> I've ever taken in my life. Like, like horrible. Yeah. Like, I want someone to go buy that product just so we can, like, be on, like, eye contact about <laughs> how absolutely disgusting it tastes. But, again, the efficacy is there. So nice. sometimes you can, you know, beggars can't be choosers. Right. <laughs> and then, yeah, I mean, just cool. just generally trying to... You know, make sure I'm I'm conscious of it. You know, working in the nightlife industry, it's easier to have availability to go out and spend more time with friends, and you know, like the relationship building, the um, you know, networking mm-hmm. side of things mm-hmm. sometimes more so leads to that. But that doesn't mean that I can't be the driving force for someone else to make those slight changes too. Mm-hmm. To where if we're going out for a work dinner and I'm like, oh, I'm not I'm not drinking tonight. Yeah. You know, maybe that unconsciously gives someone else the right to not have a drink rather sure. than like feeling that pressure. So sure. I need to remind myself of that. I'm not the best at it. And I'm also I'll sit here and tell you that moderation isn't really my thing either. So <laughs> sometimes people will be like, there'll be like an odd discussion in a meeting to where someone sees me as like the work side and the fitness professional. And they're like, oh, you probably don't drink. And then someone else in the meeting was like, this guy? <laughs> oh, you got to see this guy out when he goes. Yeah. <laughs> Not often, but yeah, when it is, it's it's a little bit hard. But I, I need to be conscious as well that mm-hmm. someone may see that that one or two days a month, yeah, that that happens and may take it as well. They're doing this more often, so I can do that too. So I think just being conscious of that and understanding that, sure, I can speak to it, sure, I can have those discussions with people. Mm-hmm. But um, perception is reality for some yeah. people. So if I can be, if it's more beneficial for me to not do that and help inspire or or put someone else on the right track. Maybe I need to take that into consideration a little bit more. Totally. I like that too. Nice. All right. Um, so we'll start to wrap it up here. Um, 
I just want to make sure uh, we didn't touch on anything that I really wanted to hit. Um, no, sweet. Okay, cool. So anything in store for the future? Anything Anything coming up? I know you said the marathon. Anything else big um, that you're looking forward to for 2022? I'm looking forward to the tour. Yep, nice. With Dylan. I'm looking forward to building out our, <coughs> our production studio. Mm-hmm. And that is just to get what we're doing out to a global audience. Cool. To hopefully help inspire some people, a bunch of different disciplines of fitness, you know, really good production value, the inspiration of having some of these like celebrities in videos to train with. I'm really looking forward to that. Continuing the in-person events. And um, you know, I've always found myself the happiest when I'm able to give back. Mm-hmm. And whether that is with, you know, doing charity marathons or giving back to, you know, whatever, Navy SEAL Foundation, which is, you know, we did a Frogman Swim a little bit ago here in Boston, or, you know, doing stuff for Phoenix Multisport, or just, you know, being able to give back. So finding different ways to do that to where even though our, you know, my goal is to grow this company, Mm -hmm. um, especially in like the on-demand world, just, you know, humbling yourself to remind it to give back, and especially to the people that have supported you along the way. And the people that may not have the same, you know, opportunities that I've sure. had to where that's, you know, I don't, I don't ever want to, I don't want to take away from any of my accomplishments or accomplishments of other people. Mm-hmm. But there is a certain time where you need to take a step back and say, hey, these were opportunities that I had. Yes, I worked my ass off for it. And yes, I did this. And, and it's not stopping anyone else from doing it. Yeah. But to be able to look back and just just understand that there there may be something you can do to help someone else realize that or be on that page. Yeah. I don't, I don't care what your <clears throat> background is, skin color, opportunities, any of that stuff. It's like if someone wants something mm-hmm. enough, they'll, you know, they'll work hard enough for it. It doesn't matter what your starting point is. You know, it's, it's the end goal and, and nothing's going to stop anyone from, from getting there. But also having said that understanding that because there are those two different starting points, Maybe reaching out a hand and, yeah. and and giving someone something could be the inspiration, and that that goes for everyone. That goes for you know people who are at Phoenix that are you know recovering addicts or people who have been given everything in their entire life and don't understand what it is to like work hard for something. To mm-hmm. people who grew up in less than ideal you know households or were in you know foster care growing up, and it's like those people who've had some some hard upbringings. Yeah, and don't want them to use that as an excuse but that doesn't mean that I can't give back totally and give every and give more of myself to to make sure that they see they they are seen felt and uh, you know have an opportunity definitely I like that like what um the GOAT, Arnold Schwarzenegger, he has his uh, 10 rules for life, his, or 10 rules for success, whatever. Yeah. I forget which one it is, but one of them is like, you got to give back to your community. Like, even after, yeah, we check off all these other things, but it's very important to, to be able to give back. So mm-hmm. that's cool. I like that. Um, and I, I know we, you plugged a lot of stuff already, uh, like uh, Big Night Live, um, Water on the Waves, CrossFit, um, Seminar Staff. But anything else you want to plug that we might have missed? Um, or a Navy SEAL Foundation as well? Yeah, and yeah. just, you know, a buddy of mine uh, operates the Frogman Swim out mm-hmm. of Boston. And another good friend of mine is the, you know, the head of partnerships for that. So I think it's just a, you know, a unique environment and a small group of military that, um, that you know, they hold close to their heart. So, mm. you know, any, but, but I mean, really any foundation where you're going to give back. Totally. Um, Gallant Few is one, kind of works with, um, you know, people transitioning from the Army that I know do some really good work, a little bit smaller. But it's sometimes it's like the smaller organizations that have a little bit more like closer, like heart to heart impact. Totally, yeah. Even though I know with like the Navy SEAL Foundation, they have like the highest rating they can as a nonprofit and mm-hmm. do do incredible things there. But that's good. Yeah. So I have you know Big Night Fitness is where you can mm-hmm. find all the events that we're doing. Um, I'll be posting a lot of stuff from there on tour. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you guys like comedians, you follow Dylan. He'll be hilarious in, on this <laughs> tour. He loves to. Uh, he loves to have a good time and cool. you know take not take himself too seriously. So uh, no, I'm just uh, grateful Sweet. you came over. Thanks for yeah, I chatting. appreciate it. Thank you so much. And I, I have one last question. I'll leave with you. Yeah. Um, another tough question, but um, if you have one like favorite quote or favorite saying, the way I describe it is like um, you get one billboard for free for a month, mm-hmm. and uh, you can put any quote you want on the billboard, and so everybody driving by on the highway gets to see it, and every day on like on the way to work or gets inspired by it. 
Yeah, so I have I have one in here that uh, <clears throat> you know I was trying to kind of write my own mantra. Cool. And even though it's not finished and it's really long, there's one that was actually it was it was the last quote in like a like a rules to live by in a gym and it was in Craig Kenny's gym. Um, who runs CrossFit Brantford and then Madison CrossFit down in Connecticut. Mm. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll pull it up here. I'll try not to. Um, it says, don't dispel rumors. Live in such a way that does it naturally. Mm. So you, you're, like your actions, actions speak louder than words in a way. Yeah, and, yeah. and don't, you know, don't get... Don't get caught up with how others are viewing you, or if there's rumors that are going around. Yeah, to like go down that that road. And I sure. look at someone like Craig Kenny and how he runs his gym, to where I don't think I've ever heard anyone say a single thing bad about him because he lives in such a way to where, as opposed to spending his time defending it, yeah, he's just spending his time proving it, <laughs> proving him wrong. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I like that a lot. And so the last two lines—I don't know if this was a direct quote because yeah. I kind of like put it into my own sure. thing. But um, it says, stop being so concerned with how others view you. Don't dispel rumors. Live in such a way that does it naturally. And I think that's that's unique. Sometimes mm. I get caught up in the in the storm of of how people view my actions that maybe don't know everything about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I'm certainly not batting a thousand on doing the right thing sure. yeah. for the right people. Um, so that was yeah. And I don't know why. Like when you said that, like it just kind of like it clicked. came into my head to where you know something I've always said. Yeah. But maybe I need to get it printed out somewhere just to, cool. just as like that daily reminder. I like that. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you so for, so much for being on. We'll wrap up with that. Um, so obviously people can find you on Instagram, like uh, uh, Facebook, Big Night Live, uh, Fitness, uh, Connor, Connor T. Murphy. T. Murphy, yeah. There's yep. another Connor Murphy who yeah. is in fitness, and he is not. We are not the same person. <laughs> C O N O R T M U R P H Y. I'm not plugging that so that you're like, oh, I gotta make sure you follow. There's like, so many people have confused me with this guy. Yeah. Who you know, again, I'm sure is, you know, is in his own right and is doing his thing, but that's sure. not me. And it's a different person. Yep. Very, very different person. So. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Connor. We are signing off. <laughs> <laughs>